Hey everyone, I'm Sarah Davis and you're watching Fight News Now, the MMA edition. Welcome to our first show of 2013. We have a lot of updates to bring you and we'll hear from some fighters ahead of their upcoming fights. John Ramdean and Robin Black will join us for three rounds on The Shift. We talk to the cast of Zero Dark Thirty and in the viral video, a song becomes a distraction to land a cheap shot. Let's get started. All good things must come to an end, so the saying goes. And for Strike Force, they sure have had a good run. But this weekend marks the final card from the promotion. And here's a look at how their goodbye from Oklahoma City will go down. Since making the switch from kickboxing to mixed martial arts in 2006, Strike Force has helped develop some of the world's elite MMA fighters, including Nick Diaz, Kung Lee, Josh Thompson, and Gilbert Melendez. However, this Saturday will mark the end of the San Jose-based company's run as the number two mixed martial arts organization in the world, but not without one last swan song. The main event will feature Strikeforce welterweight champion Nate Marquardt defending his title against Tarek Safadine. Marquardt captured the title in his only fight for the promotion with a devastating knockout of previously undefeated Tyron Woodley. Nate the Great will look to do the same against the very dangerous Safadine and launch himself back into the UFC at his new weight class. The Sponge is on a three-fight winning streak and will look to use his well-rounded game to neutralize the very skilled Marquardt. The two finalists from the heavyweight Grand Prix will also finish up their contracts on this card, with champion Daniel Cormier battling Dion Starring and finalist Josh Barnett going up against Nandor Guilmino. You may not have heard of either opponent, but don't worry as Cormier's wrestling and stand-up abilities speak for themselves. And with the only mouth in MMA that could match Chael Sonnen, Barnett is guaranteed to entertain. I'm going to show you exactly what hard times is about. Because that's what it's about when you get in the ring with Josh Barnett, baby. Woo! Who want to see that, brother? Gay guard Musasi and Mike Kyle will finally tangle in a bout that was booked more than three years ago and never materialized. After going six years with no less than three fights a year, the dream catcher missed all of 2012. We'll look to get back to his winning ways against Kyle. Opening the main card, Ed Herman will carry the UFC flag as he battles former Strike Force middleweight champion Ronaldo Jacare Souza. A spectacular win by Souza over the UFC vet would certainly put the UFC middleweight division on notice. Oh, and he gets dropped! Brunson gets dropped again! Jacare let him out! Jacare striking pinpoint, and that is it! Wow! Jacare! Jacare Souza! Marquardt dropped down to welterweight for his Strike Force debut and will continue to fight at 170 if he moves over to the UFC, which from the sounds of it is already a done deal after he faces Safadine. Uh, I haven't seen him get finished. Uh, he uh, very good striking. He trains at Team Quest, so he's well rounded. Um, but I just feel like you know uh, that I'm a better fighter, better athlete, and uh, if I come in there with my A game. I'm going to be able to finish him. I assume that I will be in UFC after this fight, and uh, I'm not concerned about that, so it's not really an issue for me. There's there's a lot of guys at, at welterweight in the UFC that I want to fight that are going to be good fights, and a lot of tough guys, uh, and uh, you know that March card is just stacked, and honestly, any one of those guys, I want to fight the, the winner of those fights. Former Strike Force middleweight champion, Ronaldo Jacare Souza, who will throw down with Ed Herman on the final card, has signed a five-fight contract with a subsidiary of Zufa, the parent company of the UFC. So win or lose at Strikeforce, Jacare is making the jump to the UFC. Strikeforce's lightweight champion, Gilbert Melendez, who has been sitting on the sidelines with an injury, says that Benson Henderson has to beat him first before Bendo can be considered the number one lightweight in the world. No word on when this fight will happen, but Dana White says El Nino's first fight will likely be a title shot and here's what he's saying about the current UFC lightweight champ. Benson is an amazing fighter, tough guy. He's, he's one guy said that uh, 
You know, initially I wasn't super impressed with WC days, but as soon as he, you know, made his first appearance in the UFC, which I in, in um, Toronto, Canada, I was really impressed, and I seen him improving every every fight since. And uh, he was an impressive guy, but I, I think I match up very well with him, and um, I think I can beat him. I feel like Nate didn't perform to his best. He he had some things going on. Uh, though Benson did pop him in the eye, and you know, and did it well. Uh, you know, you you want to you want to whoop the dude's ass. You know what I mean? You want you want to beat him up, and you want to avenge your team, you want to avenge your homie, and. Uh, you know, but um, much respect for the guy. It's nothing personal, but uh, you know, you just you want you want a piece of it. Former Bellator champion Eddie Alvarez is swimming in a mess of contractual disputes and lawsuits after the UFC offered a deal and Bellator was allowed to match it. But Alvarez says Bellator's offer is not the same at all. While Bellator CEO Bjorn Rebney says the only difference is the pay-per-view part of the contracts. Either way, Alvarez and Bellator are suing each other, and it could be a while before we see Alvarez back in action. The UFC's Michael McDonald is getting his shot at the interim bantamweight belt when he faces current interim champ Henan Barrao at UFC on Fuel TV 7 in London, England. This will be the Brazilian's first title defense. Check out what McDonald compares the match to. I can't match myself with what he does, but I, I kind of see it as the whole David Goliath thing. Um, not saying that he's a giant or I'm a boy or anything like that. He has his weapons and I have mine. And David brought a sling to a, um, a battle with a with a, a warrior, you know, a warrior who's been doing it his whole life. And that was his weapon and he was good at it. And I feel like it's the same thing. And my weapons are my basics and my defense. I consider defense more than anything a priority. I can't win if I'm unconscious. And if I could get it over with fast, I go home getting punched less. So everything I do is defensive and basic. And most of us expected this. UFC heavyweight Alistair Overeem has been granted a fighter's license in the state of Nevada, which means his planned fight with Antonio Bigfoot Silva at UFC 156 can be greenlit. This year is looking up for the Reem, who implemented a new nutritionist and refined medical team after his suspension in 2012. The landscape of the heavyweight division will likely change after the outcome of that fight and when the UFC brings Strikeforce heavyweight tournament winner Daniel Cormier in. Although there's been issues with teammates from American Kickboxing Academy facing each other, Dana White says a battle between champ Cain Velasquez and Cormier could be in the cards. The one thing that I love about these guys is, like I told you guys at the press conference before, we heard from this camp that, you know, yeah, if that's the fight that has to happen, me and Cormier will fight each other, or Cormier moves to 205 pounds, I mean, whatever the deal is. Cormier is a guy who could come in and, and do anything. I mean, he's he, a win over Josh Barnett means something, you know? AKA teammate John Fitch has an upcoming battle against Damian Maya, who made a successful debut at welterweight last summer and stopped Dung Hyun Kim and then Rick Story at UFC 153. Fitch is coming off a unanimous decision over Eric Silva and will meet Maya at UFC 156. He is a very skilled um, grappler. <clears throat> uh, he has a very good size. His positioning is outstanding. His striking has gotten way better in recent uh, years. And um, he's a different animal at 170 and 185. Just, just the, you know, his reach and physical presence is, is just something else at 170. The UFC's last card of 2012 saw the heavyweight championship rematch between Junior DeSantis and Cain Velasquez. After Velasquez dominated JDS for five rounds, he was awarded the judges' unanimous decision and took back his belt. Here's what the champ had to say post-fight. He's a tough dude, man. He's uh, really good. I mean, I was, I was surprised that I was connecting so well. And, um, you know, his takedown defense was really good. And, you know, it was tough. Um, but I think it got a little easier. Um, as a as a fight went on just a little bit, just because yeah, that the, the the pace of the fight kind of you know tired him out a little bit, but um, it was it was a tough fight. That wrestling pace of carrying somebody else's body around for for that long, it's tough, man. Um, you know, I've I've been doing it my my whole life, and um, it's a thing that you really have to be doing it. You know, you have to do it a lot, and mentally it just gets you so strong, and that's. That's what we, we've done in wrestling, and that's what we're doing now here, here, to, here in, in the UFC. Heavyweight pugilist Tyson Fury recently tweeted, I think Michael Bisping is a first-class prick. Him and Velasquez at the same time couldn't beat me. My friend KO'd Bisping, ask him. 
So John Ramdeen joins me now. And what is up with Tyson Fury? He's calling on a middleweight title contender and the best MMA heavyweight in the world. Simply put, Tyson Fury is an idiot. He clearly just wants to get the cameras and get some attention. Cain Velasquez would crush him. So he's an attention whore. That's right. <laughs> All right, so we have Robin Black and you after the break with three rounds. What's happening for that? Well, unfortunately, Saturday marks the end of Strike Force. We'll tell you which fighters will make an impact when they make their way over to the UFC. All right, so we'll see you on the other side of this break for three rounds on Fight Network. Welcome back. Three rounds is the place to be for debates, analysis, and predictions. And after a couple weeks off, John Ramdeen and Robin Black have a lot to say. So let's get down to business on three rounds, guys. Sarah, thanks so much. Saturday spells the end of Strike Force. Invicta has problems with their first pay per view, but crowns their first ever strawweight champion. And Kane Velasquez dominates JDS to recapture his heavyweight championship. But we start with Oklahoma City, the site of Strike Force, the very last event. Nate Marquardt taking on Tarek Safadine in the main event for the welterweight championship. And Robin, why have a title fight in your very last show? John Ramdeen, why not have a title fight in your very last show? Somebody tell Tarek Safadine that this belt means nothing. This guy's going to put, if he could win this belt against a very, very world-class opponent, he would put that belt on his mantle for the rest of his life. What's unfortunate about this is Strikeforce really put together a strong card for fight fans, and it's very sad that this is going to be the last event. Not only is Marquardt taking on Safadine, you're seeing two of the best heavyweights in the world, uh, Josh Barnett and Daniel Cormier in separate bouts. Of course, they fought for the uh, Grand Prix, and of course it was Daniel Cormier who emerged victorious. Each one of those guys, I'm certain, are going to make an impact when they make the move to the Ultimate Fighting Championship. And you have a feeling that's why they put these guys against some overmatched opponents. Yeah, maybe. I mean, Cormier should be a legitimate elite heavyweight in the UFC. And if that's the case, you know, why not get him to showcase his great wrestling, show his striking, and show a bit of the flair that is going to make this guy a relevant heavyweight. The thing with Barnett, this guy's for a long time been one of the great heavyweights in the world. But will he make his way to the UFC? Dana White doesn't really like him, we'll have to see. And that's one of the things I have to look at. Uh, you know, Dana White, he's been very vocal about some of the people that he doesn't like in mixed martial arts, Frank Shamrock being one of them, and Josh Barnett was another guy that he really didn't have great words to say. But now with Josh Barnett being so talented, really when you look at the way he matches up against some of the other heavyweights in the UFC, guys like Frank Mir or Czech Congo, I think he could make an impact and he could make a run for the UFC heavyweight title. Yeah, and one of the great things about elite fighting is finding those key matchups. I mean, who doesn't want to see what would happen if Josh Barnett is on top of Frank Mir? Can Frank Mir submit him? Can Barnett grind him down? This guy's for a long time been one, one of the great heavyweights we're going to get to see him in the last strike force show, but we got to see him in the UFC. Two other great matches on the card. Actually, the card is filled with some sensational matchups, but Gegard Mousasi returns to action to take on American Kickboxing Academy's Mike Kyle. But I think for my money, I have to look at the middleweight matchup between Ed Herman, who's making his way from the UFC to strike force for this last show, taking on the former 185 pound champion, Jacques Array. And I know that Jacques Array is just dying to get into the UFC. Yeah, and this is, this is interesting. Ed Herman has has some big brass balls. I mean, what are you really doing wanting to fight Jacques Array? Move downwards, in theory, to an organization beneath where you fight right now and fight a guy that tough. Big kudos to uh, Ed Herman for doing that. This is going to be a great fight. Really, this is the most competitive fight on the card, probably going to be the most exciting fight on the card. And like you mentioned, a lot of these other ones are an opportunity to showcase these guys so some fans get to see them one last time before we bring them to the UFC. This past Saturday, January 5th, and Victor was in Kansas City at the Memorial Hall. They tried to have their first pay-per-view, uh, internet pay-per-view, and unfortunately for fans of Invicta and the promotion itself, it didn't go out without a hitch. They had so many problems. Uh, US Stream, uh, the pay-per-view provider, 
they take full responsibility and it's just kind of a black mark because right now there's so much momentum behind Invicta and I think that even Zufa is probably looking at this organization considering they've now brought in the women. Yeah, you know, I like the way they handled this because they took something that was a negative and turned it into a real positive. Maybe you're going to lose a couple hundred thousand dollars of potential pay-per-view money, but they went out and they put it out for free. They care about their fans. They care about their fighters. Really, this is not the women's organization to watch. This is one of the organizations to watch in the world. It's a great promoter, great fighters, great show. They're really putting everything together. Carla Sparza emerges as the new strawweight champion, defeating Beck Hyatt. But I think I have to look at the 135-pound matchup between Alexis Davis and Shayna Baszler. Uh, Baszler, the submission uh, specialist, taking out the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, or excuse me, it's the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu fighter Alexis Davis, also Canadian, who gets the submission victory. And I think she inserts herself into that 135-pound mix. And of course, we know that Ronda Rousey, the current a UFC women's bantamweight champion is at the top of the heat, but I wouldn't be surprised if Alexis Davis sooner rather than later got her shot to fight in the UFC. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, you know, if you're an Invicta fighter, this is a, this is a company that's growing. There's some talk that maybe Showtime will be showing Invicta events in the future. We show right here on Fight Network. You know, we're proud that we've shown every single Jules um, show from the, the Japanese organization as well as Invicta. And, you know, I think for Alexis Davis, this was a really great fight. She's a, a solid solid name and we'll definitely see more from her. We know that Invicta is scheduled to have their next event in April which will feature former Strike Force women's bantamweight champion Sarah Kaufman and I'm sure this time uh, US Stream will get their their act together and give fans exactly what they want as well as the promotion. And Robin we got to get to what happened at UFC 155. Cain Velasquez recaptures his uh, heavyweight championship with a five round domination of Junior DeSantos. Did you expect to hear that domination? Cain Velasquez, five rounds. Yeah, I actually did. I, I know we're not going to show tape of it, <laughs> but when we discussed leading up to this fight, I was the only guy saying that I thought Cain Velasquez was going to take it. Cain Velasquez has consistently been the very best heavyweight in the last half decade, with the exception of one big punch that landed behind his ear. Now we remove that punch, you, he starts with a round one as vicious and as violent and as aggressive as he did at UFC 155 and he just ran from there. The guy looks unstoppable. What I like about this fight is yes, Cain Velasquez, he won, he's the new champion, but I think now for Junior DeSantos, he gets to go back to the drawing board, kind of amend his game plan, work on some of the things that he wasn't able to do in that fight with Cain Velasquez and I think we're going to see a bigger, better and stronger Junior, uh, junior DeSantos, maybe not bigger because he looked ripped <laughs> in that fight with Big Cain dude. Velasquez. You know, they each have one win. One guy just beat one guy, you know, beat his opponent for, for 25 minutes, and the other one knocked him out in a couple of minutes. That, to me, is pretty even. I can't wait to see it again. Sarah, next week, we take a look at the two UFC events that are coming up before the end of the month, including the tilt between Michael Bisping and Vitor Belfort. It is going to be good. Oh, yeah. 2013 is getting off to a great start. Thanks, guys. After the break, we're looking at history's greatest manhunt for the world's most dangerous man and on the viral video, find out which one of these guys gets totally duped. Whoa, 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 whoa. You're watching Fight News now, and this Friday night on Fight Network, we have the ultimate match between two legends. It's Alien vs. Predator starting at 9 p.m. Eastern on January 11th. And we're also bringing you the epic New Year's Eve Dream 18 show from Saitama, Japan. That gets underway at 6 p.m. Eastern on Saturday night. Now let's check out our viral video, which isn't worthy of a prestigious award, but it does showcase a different kind of technique to use against an opponent. And that is Gangnam Style gone too far. On that note, we're done, but thank you for joining us. Don't forget to catch Alien vs. Predator and Dream 18 this weekend. And as John Pollock has called it, the death of Strike Force. Enjoy the fights.